Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And uh, good morning to everyone. It's good to be here with you this morning. I, I, feel, I feel blessed that we can even be here together this morning. A, a week ago, I was pretty sure that, uh, that I was going to be here on this platform today, but I, I wasn't quite sure if there was going to be anybody in, in the seats. I had visions of preaching to an, an open room and save for everyone who was watching on, on camera. Um, that was what I had envisioned. But uh, day to day, week to week, we, we, we don't know what is going to happen. We don't know what time brings. So I'm thankful that we can be here together. Churches all over the country are, um, are, are dealing with the same dynamics, and we're thankful for the chance we can be together. Um, just looking across the country, there's a few examples of how um, churches are, are looking to make this decision week by week, and also encourage and reach out to their community. So I have a few examples to look at here. Um, North Lake Lutheran Church, trying to reach their community, saying, wash your hands, don't touch your face. Uh, Genesis 24-7, stay home. <laughs> no Sunday worship this week. First Baptist Church, they're going to meet, though. They're saying, shout Hosanna, but first, make sure we keep that six feet. They're going to step back. Bethany Free Will Baptist is reminding the community that Jesus cleans the heart but they're going to make sure that the pews are disinfected. This last one, it made me chuckle a little bit. Wesley United says, we are praying and listening to the scientists. And, and I, uh, at first, I was taken back. I thought, man, theology is a little bit messed up. But um, I, think I, I think I understand what they're trying to say. So this Sunday, it rounds out the Thanksgiving weekend. And more than a year ago, I, I asked Tom if I, could, if I could specifically have this week to speak. Since Thanksgiving is my, is my favorite holiday, I thought that I would take the opportunity to channel some of my personal enjoyment for this holiday and, and, and direct it into a study of, of a spiritual perspective and, and discipline for, for what Thanksgiving can mean for the believer. I certainly had no idea that this year would transpire as it has, and I think most of us would say that it's been, it's been a tough year in one way or another. And though I, although I have so much to be thankful for this, this past Thursday, if I'm, if I'm honest, was, was not the traditional experience of family togetherness that, that I uh, normally enjoy so much. Nevertheless, the Lord is faithful, and I, and I do hope you were able to spend some time with at least a few family members or perhaps some close friends this week, and, and that maybe you've had at least a brief time to ponder and give thanks for something that God has done in your life. Maybe it was just for the food. Perhaps it was just that you've made it through this, this, this year, and that would be okay. Because uh, that's kind of the way Thanksgiving, it all started. It was uh, December of 1620, 400 years ago, that the pilgrims landed at Plymouth. And we know the story how the group of approximately 100 people endured obstacles and, and many delays to finally reach the New World. Arriving so late in the fall in New England, well, that was just, that was just the, the start of a very hard, very hard year for them. Many would perish in those first few months. And the harsh reality of their pilgrimage would be in front of them every day. Only 52 would survive the first year. The following fall, the fall of 1621, one of the settlers, Edward, Edward Winslow, he recorded some details in the midst of a letter that he wrote that would outline what would become known as the, the first Thanksgiving. The holiday, or as Winslow called it, a special manner of rejoicing together. It was, it, was, it was likely earlier in the fall compared to when we celebrate it, co coinciding with, a, with the end of a successful harvest. 
The harvest we see was one of the main reasons for the event, and, and stopping to recognize the goodness of God and his provision was also an element of the three-day feast. From Winslow's account, it seems that abundant fowl, perhaps it was turkey, and venison brought by the Indians were, were on the menu. There was no football, but there was other sport and appears target practice also did occur. So as mentioned, Thanksgiving is, is my favorite holiday. And while I recognize that the history of American Thanksgiving is far less uh, significant from a, from a Christian perspective than, than the likes of Easter or, or Christmas, I have found that I enjoy the opportunity to to, uh, and the occasion to, to stop and reflect on blessings, both small and great in my life, that the Lord, that the Lord has done. Maybe, maybe you're the same. Having a holiday or time set aside to give thanks, well, it helps us to, to, to remember not only what God has done, but it also helps us to reflect on the character of who he is. It helps us praise him. It helps us bring glory to his name. In the season of the next month, where we'll be continually influenced by the, round, the world around us to to evaluate all manner of physical things that we could need or want. I find that there's some value in having a time before it begins to, to set our minds on being thankful. So I thought we might take this time together to look at, at some attributes from Scripture that can encourage us on in living thankfully. I have titled the message, uh, Living in Thanksgiving. And we, we've heard a psalm of Thanksgiving, Psalm 111 already. I'd like to also look at a passage from the book of Luke that likewise encompasses the aspects of giving thanks. Before we go there, let's, let's open in prayer together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for your son Jesus and for his saving work. We're grateful for your word to us and how we can be challenged in our spirit as we, as we study it together. I pray that this morning, Lord, your, your spirit would be moving in our hearts and our minds and that we would be blessed as we consider what you have for us. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So open your Bibles with with me, if you will, to uh, Luke chapter 17. We're going to primarily be looking at verses 11 through 19. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Starting in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Our passage this morning, it opens with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem from the north. To help put it in context in uh, the, the history of the Lord, this journey to Jerusalem would culminate in his crucifixion. The area he's traveling through is the area near uh, Samaria and Galilee. And you may remember, or you may already know, that culturally there was no love lost between the Jews and the Samaritans. Many Jews coming from the north heading south would, would, would go out of their way, even taking a longer journey just to avoid going through Samaria. Now the text doesn't tell us if the, if the village was, was Jewish or Samaritan. Mainly our account this morning revolves around the people who were infected with the health condition called leprosy. Culturally, anyone diagnosed with leprosy, they would have to remain apart from the rest of the population. Leviticus chapter 13 outlines the, uh, what, that people with these conditions would remain outside the camp, outside their society. Further, lepers, because of their infectious condition, they'd be required to announce to anyone who came near them that they were unclean so that an accidental exposure did not occur. I imagine many towns and villages would would have small groups of leprous people residing outside the normal society, just just outside the town. And perhaps that's the case here, as Jesus comes into the proximity of these these ten lepers as he's going into the village. You know, health conditions that easily spread through a community that require segregation or quarantine and could possibly bring death 
apparently are not a new phenomenon. On the screen is a portion of a page from Mayo Clinic website. It, it describes a health condition. It says the health condition spreads by airborne droplets, requires medical diagnosis, often needing lab tests for results. And, and while treatable, the condition could have side effects that last a long time. The highlighted portions kind of sound similar to our, to our COVID-19 pandemic, doesn't it? When I uncover the shielded portions, the page we can see that the ailment being described is really what we were talking about before. It's, it's leprosy. Leprosy is not as common today, but it, it is still uh, listed as a chronic infectious disease, mainly causing skin lesions and nerve damage. Many who have, contact, uh, have contracted leprosy in the past saw signs of, of white patches of skin as an early symptom. Those infected with leprosy could experience nerve damage that may, may result in, in the loss in, of feeling in their hands and feet. With the loss of feeling, injuries to those regions of the body can easily be sustained and causing further complication, possibly resulting in the loss of fingers or toes. Many medical journals also indicate that vocal cords are often affected as well causing speech to be painful, hoarse, and difficult. Facial feature deformity, along with blindness, may occur if, if the disease settles in the nerves in the facial region. Now, whether there are medical treatments for this disease now, in Bible times, we, we rarely ever hear, we really only ever hear of, uh, of leprosy in terms of being a slow but, but fatal condition. If you think back to some Bible stories that perhaps you know that involve leprosy, there's there's Naaman, the Syrian army commander from 2 Kings 5. He was high in rank and, and great indeed, but, but he became a leper. He contracted leprosy. The story goes on, and the only place of possible he healing for him lay with the prophet Elisha in the subservient land of Israel. When Naaman arrives at the king of Israel with a letter asking, asking for Naaman to be healed, the king of Israel, he tears his clothes saying, Am I God? Can I bring this man back from the dead? God, through Elisha, did heal Naaman after he dipped in the Jordan River seven times. You may also remember the account from Jesus' ministry recorded earlier in Luke, Luke 5. Jesus was there in the northern region in the town of Gennesaret when he was approached by a leper. The Bible says in that account that the leper himself was full of leprosy. The leper throws himself at Jesus' feet, begging Jesus with the words, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was willing and, and did make him clean. Jesus told the man not to tell anyone else, but to, but to show himself to the priest. Verse 15 of that chapter says, Yet news about him, that's, that's Jesus, spread all the more. Given the time and space between Luke 5 and, and our passage today in Luke 17, it's, it's possible the ten lepers from today's account may have heard of the saving power of, of Jesus. Power that had proven they could heal even leprosy. Our passage today, Luke 17, verse 12, shows that the, that the lepers knew Jesus' name. They yell out, which, which, which may have been immensely hard or even painful, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So what do you think they'd heard? No doubt they'd heard that Jesus had, had done miracles, perhaps that he had healed leprosy. And now he was, right here, entering their town. Some might say, hey, it's your lucky day. Some might say, this is the only chance you have. Others might say, this is your only hope. The tone of the other leprosy passages that we looked at kind of indicates that, that leprosy had little hope. Certainly thinking through the physical suffering of this disease is it's disturbing. But personally, I would say that the, that the separation from others, well, that might be the worst part. To live outside the town, a away from your family, outside of society, continually calling out to anyone who may come by, unclean, unclean. That would just be horrible. It's the, it's the literal version of adding insult to injury. And though it's not right, I'm sure that nearly all in those times who, who did not have leprosy, who were not infected, they probably didn't want to be anywhere near those who did. Children would be taught to stay away. Lepers would be, would be stigmatized, ignored, perhaps mistreated. For the lepers, the feeling of being disconnected from family and friends without work or purpose and treated as an outcast with only as a miracle as their hope, that must have been immensely difficult. But the passage today seems to indicate that the ten, the ten groups of lepers, 
the, the group of ten lepers, was made up of both Jews and at least one Samaritan. It's interesting that the common ailment that they had, that overshadowed the cultural distance that the groups would normally seek. The requirements of law and the need for human interaction, it, it, it kind of bonded them together. The lepers in society, they would have, they kind of would have been in front of everybody each day, yet just outside, being just outside the town. But yet, I imagine most people would not have stopped to actually see the leper's plight, to, to offer some sort of help or encouragement. You know, there's people like that today as well. Our society may have more advanced medical abilities, but there are still those people that for, for whatever reason, they're, they're always with us, but they're just outside the boundaries of, of the normal, outside what, see, outside what we see. They're not easy to engage. I'm thankful for the people and for the ministries from here and in our region who, who, who make an effort who use their gifts to be part of reaching out to encourage, to offer hope in the gospel to those who are hurting and alone. These Christians are striving to be like the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus saw the lepers, not, not just to physical, visually see them, but he saw them as people, people just like everyone else, that they were not just a backdrop or a peripheral. Look at verse 14. It starts with, when he saw them, you probably don't have leprosy, physically at least. But we were all born into a, a spiritual leprosy, right? A condition that keeps us separated from our, from our creator, a holy God. Maybe you feel spiritually like a leper would feel. Perhaps you feel abandoned, an outcast, too unclean to be accepted. Maybe you feel alone. But if so, let me offer you the greatest hope there ever was or ever will be. Just like those lepers in Luke 17, we... We can cry out to Jesus. His work on the cross where he died for our sins, it gives redemption. It gives everyone the opportunity to have a relationship with him, to be spiritually cleansed, to be brought into an eternal spiritual family. If you don't know that to be true in your life, I would, I would encourage you to talk with me or anyone else here you know as a believer. Just like the lepers, don't let this opportunity, don't let this day pass. The Bible, it's a, it's a wonderful book, and it gives us so much insight into the things of God. There's blessing every time that uh, Scripture is studied. Someone recently asked me what biblical event I would have liked to have been actually present for, to, to see firsthand. That's a tough question. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you know what you would say. I, I'm not quite sure. Perhaps witnessing creation, maybe walking through the Red Sea with the Israelites, Possibly watching the meeting of, of Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. Maybe one of the miracles that Jesus did, like walking on the water or, or feeding 5,000 people. Those would be remarkable. Certainly, certainly that first Easter Sunday, that would definitely be among the top choices. As I pondered this question while preparing for the message, I really began to think that it would be wonderful to see and hear firsthand the interactions of Jesus with others. The events we know already in Scripture, but the but to know them in a greater detail, to watch the message un, unfold in the interaction with Jesus with other people, to see how perfect love communicated. You know, Jesus must have been an amazing communicator. We know, we know that children were drawn to him everywhere. We know that multitudes followed him wherever he went. The interpersonal dynamics that the disciples would have witnessed were undoubtedly amazing. Our passage today, it only records a few words, a few sentences from the Lord. And yet I have to believe that added to what we know, the, the voice tone, the body language, the, the nonverbal communication of Jesus, it would have been a remarkable experience. So I think to answer the question for me, I think that experiencing Jesus' interactions are among the biblical event, events I would most like to see. And I praise the Lord that one day I'll get to have my own personal interactions with my Savior, Jesus Christ. So back to our, our story today, the, the Lord sees the ten lepers, and he responds to the request for pity or, or for mercy, as some translations say. But interestingly enough, he, he doesn't make them clean immediately. In the Luke 5 passage, the leper there, Jesus simply declared, declared be clean. And the leprosy left that man. But here, like Naaman, the lepers are told, they're told to do something. They must respond with action, stepping out in faith. If you remember back to the story of Naaman, he, he wasn't really happy about following the instructions he was given, was he? 
He had to go to the Jordan River and wash seven times. And initially, he leaves Elisha's hut. He leaves it angry. But after a wise question from one of his servants, he obeyed. And on the seventh dip in the Jordan, he came out clean. Our ten lepers today, they may have also been equally questioning what they were told to do. Levitical law required a person with leprosy to show themselves to the priest. And then if they believed they were clean, to come back and show themselves to the priest. And the priest would declare their status. The presumption would be that before going back to the priest, that you would be clean. And these ten, ten lepers, they're sent on their way, not having been made clean yet. They were called to act out in faith first. Maybe their interaction with Jesus had, had strengthened their faith. Maybe they trusted what they had heard before, the reputation of Jesus and, and the works that he had done. Perhaps it was simply like they felt like they had nothing else left in this life to lose. So why not obey and, and see what the Lord would do? Regardless of the mindset, whatever that was, they did as they were instructed. And the word tells us that they were, they were healed as they went. As Christians, I think it can sometimes easy to be easy to be easy to forget that that the Lord calls us to action and gives us opportunities for obedience even when everything else is not right in the world, even when when perhaps we're not proposed most prepared in our spirit to to step out in faith. But there is blessing in following Him, listening to His word and and walking by faith. The reasoning of this world, the temptations of our culture even sometimes our own lack of a desire to, to obey. They can mire us. They can mire us in a slew. It may seem crazy to live for Jesus, crazy to others, crazy to the world, but thank you, but thanks to the Lord, when we, when, but praise the Lord and thank him that when we do grow, we do obey, we grow in a right relationship with him, and it, and it makes every other priority in our life fade from being so pressing. And just like the lepers who are on their way, we get to experience the blessings that he has for us. So returning to our, our text, the second half of verse 14, it says, as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. I'll just stop there just for a moment. I pondered what, the, what these, these steps, this, this short journey for the 10, what it was like. Walking away, I, who knows how far, when they, when they start to notice, they start to notice the healing. Was it, was it one at a time? Was it all at once? Was it gradually on each one? Did they notice it on each other first? Scripture doesn't tell us, and overall, it's really not important, but, but thinking through those steps, what that experience was like, the realization of the burden that was being lifted, the change that was happening in them, in those steps as they walk by faith, it just makes me smile. With the evidence needed now, secured, for the declaration of a priest to say that they were clean. Perhaps, perhaps the nine ran to secure that as fast as they could before it was too late, before maybe it would change. Maybe they wanted to leave no doubt on their complete and timely obedience to the Lord. Certainly, all ten were, were, were more than excited to rejoin the lives they had lost and, and to no longer live as outcasts. Again, we don't know the heart motives of the nine, but what we do know is, is how the remaining leper responded. And this is, is really the main point of where we want to get to today. 15 says, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to, to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Our lone leper, upon recognizing he's, he, that he's healed, he responds with a, with a heart full of praise and thanksgiving. The text says he came back praising in a, in a loud voice. It doesn't seem that Jesus has gone too far from where the, where the ten first encountered him. But the whole way back, calling out loudly to anyone in earshot, the man is praising God. A person who used to stay in there and shout, unclean, is now shouting about what the Lord has done for him. I don't know exactly what he was saying, but I get the feeling that he doesn't care what anybody thinks, and he can't contain himself. It's kind of like the uh, character George Bailey in, in uh, um, the movie It's a Wonderful Life. If you've ever seen that, at the climax of the story, George, George realizes that, that his gift 
that his life is a gift, and, and, and he runs through the snow-covered town, exuberantly wishing everyone in, in, in Bedford Falls a, a Merry Christmas. Similarly, our friend in the story today, he's, he's on his way, and he's proclaiming God's goodness with all his heart. Let's look back at Psalm 111 that Danny read earlier. In this, in this psalm of praise and thanksgiving, examine what the, the, the writer says. First off, he begins and ends the psalm with, with praising the Lord. Next, he says he will give thanks with his, with his whole heart, both in the council of the upright and also in the assembly, in small groups and in large. Proclaiming thanks to the Lord is what he's going to do. Psalm 111 is largely about the, the great works of the Lord and how they reflect on, on who he is and how he is worthy of admiration. The psalmist and now our cleansed leper friend, they're, they're both intentional when they're praised for the, the praise of the Lord. And that's a good example for us as believers too. I know, I know several believers whose praise to the Lord is, is, is early and often. Their MO isn't to run through the town and, and shout God's goodness, but they are quick to remember and declare the Lord's goodness to us, his blessing, his sovereignty. They make a point to interject his praise in nearly every conversation. They do it in a true and, 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 and well-placed remembrance of who it is who has provided every blessing and who it is who works through every circumstance. Maybe you know someone like that too. It's a refreshing occurrence to hear someone say that the, that the Lord has blessed them in this week in, in this or, or that. Or perhaps a, a circumstance, you know, it's been difficult recently, but they outwardly acknowledge that, that God's in control, and they praise Him for that. It certainly is a testimony to the world around us when we pro pro proclaim the praise of the Lord. It's, it, this could be a challenge for us, though, as believers, can it? It's been a tough year, right? We may be tempted to think that if we had like a, a, a leprosy cleansing event, we would shout that from the rooftops, that we would rise to that level of praise and thanksgiving that an incident like that would spur us on to more and more outward expressed praise and thanks for the Lord. But the truth is that the Lord is work, working in our lives every day. Ultimately, even on the worst days, we as believers can rejoice that, that our sins have been forgiven, paid for by the blood of Jesus, that, that the condemnation and eternal separation that we should have had to endure, it's gone. When we, when we remember that perspective, it actually makes the healing of of, of leprosy kind of look like a small thing. It's a good thing to remember and ponder the works of the Lord. The psalmist reminds us that in verse 2. And while it is a good a, a daily exercise for us as believers, it's, it's also a blessing to do it weekly as a body as well. The breaking of bread time here each week, is a, it's a precious time. where We can come together and, and corporately remember the person and the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus himself asked us to remember him. As the psalmist says here in verse 7, the, the Lord's precepts or his commands, they're, they're, they're trustworthy. It's good for us to gather and do as he's asked. If you're not in the habit of meeting with us, I would encourage you to do that. Back in Luke, the leper has been cleansed and he's now made it back and he's found Jesus. Verse 16 says he, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. Just a short time before, this leper was alienated and he couldn't be close to anyone and now, in a most sincere and humble and telling manner, the leper is close to the Lord, giving him thanks. It's been said that thankfulness is more of an, an attitude than it is really a feeling. The sincerity of this man's outward expression, of his, of his inward perspective, well, it reminds us of other places in Scripture where, where people have, have done something similar, where they have fallen on their faces before the Lord. Think back to when God confirmed the covenant with with Abraham, Genesis 17, Abraham fell on his face. When God sent the angel to destroy Jerusalem after David had abandoned faith and numbered the army in 1 Chronicles 21, David fell on his face. To Peter, James, and John, when Jesus had been transfigured on the mount and they had missed, missed the point and offered to build temples for Jesus and Moses and Elijah in Matthew 17, the disciples fell on their faces. These were, these were all somber and serious events where, where people responded, recognizing the presence of a holy God. This leper today, his actions of falling at Jesus' feet, declare that Jesus is a deity, the God 
that Jesus is. Our leper is thanking God. We too, choosing to be thankful, it can help us take our minds off of ourselves and our circumstance and remember who it is and who has and who will provide for us. As believers, we can never exhaust the thanks and praise to the Lord. Our, our loud and praise-filled leper, he is, he's thrown himself at the feet of Jesus. I doubt he waited in line to do that or for a break in the conversation to, to thank the Lord. I, I picture what this scene and the events here would say to those who are, who are around Jesus at that time. I imagine every conversation kind of coming to a sudden stop. Anybody who hadn't seen or heard this guy approaching, to this point now they just, they just stopped and watched. Aside from the leper's thanks, I suspect that you could, could have heard the proverbial pin drop. So what's Jesus do with the, with the stage being set like that? At this point, Jesus takes the opportunity to ask three questions. Really, these are rhetorical questions if we look at them. Questions that have an obvious answer, that are spoken for effect or to, to, to provoke thought or to make a point. Of course, Jesus, as God, he, he already knew the answer to all three. So what are the point of the questions? I think there's at least two points that come to, to light to me. First off, the questions show that what the leper is doing, I, I think it reinforces that what he's doing is good, that it's right, that the Lord is pleased when we take the time to identify his place his provision and the blessings of our life, and when we come to back to him and thank him for it, how often do we stop and, and give thanks? Probably not as often as we should. Definitely not as often as we could. It takes discipline to make, make that a part of our daily life. And as, as we've already seen, it's not only pleasing to the Lord and, and good for our focus individually as believers, but it's, it's also a testimony to those around us. And it's this last aspect that I, I think ties, ties into maybe the second reason for Jesus asking these questions. I think it's really for the benefit of, of everyone there, all those who were listening, all those who had stopped to see what was unfolding. I submit that the second point of the questions is to show everyone that the foreigner is accepted. Luke snuck this fact in in late in verse 16 that, that our leper is a Samaritan. The good guy in the story is, uh, he's not the likely one, or even the culturally accepted person. Again, we don't know if the village was Jewish or Samaritan, but either way, the message is going to be understood. That The takeaway for the people who are hearing the message from the Lord is that he came to save everyone. He came to save all people. He just saved a Samaritan. How often in Scripture have we seen that God saves the unlikely, that God uses the least likely, that that God loves those who others don't love. Jesus came to save, save the world. Culturally, that was a hard message, and it was going to take a number of, of, of years and events for the church to get on board with that. But Jesus, in his, in, in his tender mercy and his infinite wisdom, he's preparing his followers. He's challenging their minds with rhetorical questions. Remember, he's, he's headed towards Jerusalem and for the cross. His followers would soon have these incidents to refer back to, to remember. Jesus' ministry and saving work was, was for any who had faith and believed. And this is a good thing for us to remember, too. We should, we should praise him because his saving work included us. And we should also remember that it includes the least likely among us. If we're to be like our Lord, our ministry should also reach out to those who are, who are hard to see and hard to touch, hard to accept. Our account today ends with Jesus telling the man to, to, to rise and go, verse 19. I'm sure that the tone and body language of the Lord was nothing short of being, being warm and full of love. And though it's not said, I, I, I would not doubt if the Lord touched or embraced this man, a man who had not had that experience in quite some time. The man had shown himself to the great high priest, and Jesus had reaffirmed his faith and given him new life. Some commentators believe the word here used for the man being made well or, or healed refers to his spirit being saved. And, and I can understand that. I can see that. While only the Lord knows the heart, perhaps, perhaps another soul had been saved. Another life had been changed. Another thankful heart was in a right relationship with the Lord. 
And really, that's what, what living in thanksgiving helps us do, isn't it? It helps us keep our perspective on the Lord rather, rather than on ourselves. The psalmist makes this closing point too. Look in verse 10 of Psalm 111. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. This verse mirrors other verses you may be familiar with in Proverbs, but it, but it means that those who fear or respect or have a right relationship with God, following his direction, they have wisdom. They will, they will have good understanding. The response to that is eternal praise and thanksgiving. And my, my fellow believers and friends, I, I pray that that would be true for us. So let's close this meeting. I'll close in prayer and then we will be dismissed. Our dear God and Father, we, we praise your name and we give you thanks for your son Jesus. We are grateful for the salvation we can have through his perfect work. We are thankful for your word and what it teaches us about you. We marvel at the blessing of eternal life and what it will be like to, to be near you for eternity. Lord, help us to walk worthy of your calling. Help us to recognize and remember your blessings. May we be quick to run back to, to you in praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we ask you to take us from here with hearts that desire to be close to yours. It's in your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.